when you think of asset allocation for these clients, how do you go about thinking about it? Simply because, I mean, this is different, right? This client probably has a strong opinion herself or himself. Absolutely. So there are two ways to look at asset allocation with these sort of clients. And one is, you know, uh, the standard asset allocation. And I'll come to that, which is, you know, how much debt and how much equity. But for this set of clients, what we also do is something more nuanced. And uh, that is that do, we do a need based asset allocation. So the idea is that what does the client need to do with this money? Because obviously it's not to meet his day to day requirements. It, he has enough and more uh, of this surplus. So what we try and bucket it is that, you know, we've created a sort of a framework and I'll just share uh, that framework. One is what we call, you know, the lifestyle needs. And uh, typically that may include art, philanthropy, his day to day, you know, running the house and, you know, travel. And because these are all big components for them. But the idea is that none of this should come from the capital. The idea is that this comes from the portfolio. So we create a portfolio and this cash flow. So it's basically a reverse, you know, that what you need to spend in the year. And it depends on, you know, type of the client. And this number can be very, very different, you know, including luxury cars or, you know, luxury villas and all that stuff. But ultimately, we do not want them to dip into their core capital. And therefore, the cash flow has to come from the portfolio. And that is, I think, a very different thinking that we try and bring to the table. The second is a lot of these guys want to invest in growth companies. And it's a serious, uh, you know, investment. So in terms of, you know, either incubating new ideas or a uh, lot of times they want to invest in technologies related to their existing business. So just to give an example, if somebody's in the automotive business, from their family office, they, want, they may want to seed certain automotive technology companies. A mm -hmm. uh, lot of guys who are in healthcare, they actually want to invest in new technologies in healthcare. But a lot of times that is either done from their incubation centers in the companies, but a lot of times from the family offices. And a lot of it is also in, you know, new age startups, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that is what we call the growth portfolio. The third is what we call the boring or, you know, the standard portfolio, which is where we say you do nothing fancy. This is a place where you just invest for the long term thinking in a moderate manner. And the fourth is what we call a safety net or a sinking fund. You know, when markets go through extreme bouts of turmoil or people may suffer, you know, uh, some risks in their business, they should have a safety net is what we say. So this is a core basic philosophy that you, know, you look at lifestyle, you look at your growth, look at a treasury or a moderate portfolio and your safety net. This is how we start the basic buff, uh, you know, bucketing of the needs. And it also couples with you know, next generation planning, next generation thinking, uh, how much they want to keep for their succession, a lot of times for children. A lot of times children want, want to incubate new businesses. Are you keeping money aside for that? So I think the asset allocation is an output of first getting this input done. And then you invest according to that. And that is how it is possibly different from, you know, the regular asset allocation. Because that's, this is your, this sits on the top of asset allocation. And then you come to the asset allocation because each portfolio, the asset allocation will be uh, different. Right. For you know, and this will be different for each client as well. Of course. Yeah, yeah but on, on average, does safety play a larger part than growth typically? Again, depends on the where the client is in his journey. So to again uh, give a context, uh, if somebody has sold his business, the person may be in his fifties or uh, late fifties, uh, but his children are all twenty-seven to thirty year old. So in that, they will create a safety net. But beyond that, they want to take risk because the children want to you know, invest in a particular manner. And what we are also seeing that as the wealth is moving from one generation to the other. And if you and I'll just give a back context here in India, it's not so much that, you know, wealth is multi generational. You know, you have these old traditional business families, but, you know, you have 100, 200 of those. But a lot of the money that is getting generated is a lot of the businesses that started 20, 25 years ago, a lot of, you know, in manufacturing, say pipes, cement, mid markets, a lot of these, and then obviously the new age IT uh, or the digital mm. boom that has come. Now, a lot of these people who have come into money are first generation. Sure. They may be, and I'm just keeping the new age aside, uh. then the age group is between a 45 to 60. Okay. And that's when they've come into money. And I can give a Examples and examples of a lot of listed companies today or, you know, some of the companies which have uh, done stake sales and all the promoters are in this age group. Sure. And the children are in the age group of, you know, 25 to 40. 
-hmm. Now for that generation which is now moved, but the money is moved from generation 1 to generation 2. Mm -hmm. And imagine a scenario where generation 1 has worked very hard, built the business and generation 2 either has to build a new business or is in only managing this money, which is itself a very important and a big uh, task. Therefore, the outlook has changed and therefore this need for you know the wide spectrum. Like to give a sense and uh, I don't want to preempt this, but you know international as a theme. Uh, five years ago, if you ask any Indian, ki international, why are you not investing in international, they'll say, ki, how does it matter? I don't want to do. But today, if you ask them, because the children are all foreign educated, they possibly have a house abroad, they want to spend some time abroad, they want to do international investing. Also, the fact that uh, the they realize that their entire money is in a single asset class mm -hmm. and that asset class is rupee. Of course. Yeah. For the first time that realization has come that you know you're in a single asset class, can I diversify my currency exposure and therefore you're seeing a lot more of international. So I'm saying that thinking or approach towards money management is actually changing. Sure. It's very different from the old traditional way that we had seen. Mm -hmm.